Um, before I start, can I just do a quick check in the room to figure out what audience I'm talking to? Because every time we speak, it's you know, healthcare, social care, individual citizens, and everything. So, can you put your hands up if you're health and care by background? Okay, can you put your hands up if you're a business? Okay, uh, individual citizens just here for interest? Okay, right. I've probably missed someone. Uh, academics? There we go. <laughs> um, I've probably missed someone, and apologies if I have. Um, so that, that's useful. So I'm going to give you my predominantly health and care version of this, um, but I'll maybe talk a little bit about some of the citizens, citizens side. Um, so quickly, just going to talk about uh, Scotland's innovation centres. Um, I've got a little video to show you. Uh, describe what we do, uh, and then I'm going to walk you through um, some Scottish Government uh, initiatives that are kicking off the DHI around a few challenges, um, and uh, I'll talk you through uh, how we do that, and there's a lot of um, citizen co-design activities that we'll be doing to, to help inform uh, Scottish Government strategy in those areas. Um, and then I'll talk to you a little bit about some of the te technology demonstration work we'll be doing uh, with partners and localities around Scotland uh, going forward. So. Um, the Innovation Centre Programme, I'm not going to speak too much about this, as I said, I'll play you a, a wee clip, um, but uh, it's a Scottish Government initiative um, that effectively says that we've got huge wealth of capability in Scotland's uh, <coughs> academic and business um, circles, um, and we need to try and uh, apply that as, uh, more in, a, in a focused fashion towards uh, real needs in Scotland's uh, economy, effectively. Um, so th the main purpose of all of this activity, if you ever see an Innovation Centre stand up to talk to you, the purpose of everything is economic development for Scotland. So just taking care of the entire Scottish economy and trying to just move things forward and, and help Scotland become more prosperous. Here's a quick video. Innovation can take many forms. It can be a different way of delivering for customers. Okay, so um, as you probably picked up from that, quite a diverse spread of innovation centres working on different uh, topics. Uh, we're talking about digital health and care here today. Um, so what is digital health and care? You will have probably heard all sorts of technology terms around healthcare. Um, you may have heard of M Health, which is mobile health. Um, you may have heard of uh, wireless and various other health 2.0 terms. The media is full of this stuff, and effectively, over the last 10 years, it's all slowly come together under the term digital health. Um, so it's effectively, you know, meaning anything that involves the digital transfer of information from one place to another to support a different way of working. Okay, so it's pretty casual. At DHI, as you. So on the video, just like our innovation centres, we help bring academia and business together specifically. Um, our innovation centre is a little bit different insofar as we are part funded by the NHS and social care. So 
we've got a third partner in the, in, 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 in the, in the, in the play, which is obviously these very large health and care organisations and third sector organisations to, to, to help um, describe what we need. Um, and the last bit around what we do is we've got a team of um, co-designers that Glasgow School of Art provide for us who uh, are specialists in working with individual citizens, patients, carers, professionals to <coughs> figure out what their needs are um, because all too often technology is developed for the organisation, not the people involved in the organisation. So we spent the last four years um, doing a fair bit of activity. So DHI has a thousand members. Uh, any of you can sign up as members as an individual. It's not something you can be part of an organisation for, and that's just if you're interested in new technology around health. Um, become a member, you get you know, the newsletter, and you know, fairly typical kind of uh, uh, membership offer. It's free, um, so please uh, come along to our website and have a look. What we um, have done is from that membership, we draw project partners. Now, to be a project partner, you do need to be an organisation or an individual working with an organisation. Um, and we create collaborative projects between academia, business, health, care, third sector, um, and figure out new ways of creating new digital products <coughs> with those collaborations. Um, through that activity over the last four years, we've uh, implemented new digital technologies for around 5,000 people. Um, so that's your, your patients, your citizens, your, 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 your informal and formal carers. And what what we've effectively done there is we've used 2.4 million pounds of grant money that we hold uh, and we use that uh, to pay largely for an, uh, academic contribution and some health and care contribution so that when a business comes along uh, with a bright idea they can actually get it into use quickly and the academic community can help us understand that it's valuable and how to, uh, how to improve it. Um, and then that money allows industry to put in the extra so the businesses that come and work with us put in three and a half million pounds over a course of a number of uh, 105 projects uh, to co-fund these things. So this is a way for Scottish health and care organisations in particular to collaborate with industry, which isn't about buying their service, it's about cr creating new solutions together. And we've developed 45 new digital products over the last four years off the back of that. And so that's an, anything from, um, we've got um, one device that you'll see out on our stand, which is ResBosk, which is a uh, smart camera that uh, will read your vital signs. So effectively, monitors the different changes in your skin pigmentations. Your, your, your skin is always subtly shifting in, in shades of, uh, of pink and red. Um, and it can pattern from that and the way that the blood is circulating through your body. And it can tell your heart rate and your blood oxygen saturation and your temperature. So this is a camera, but the camera doesn't actually record you. So it doesn't, it's not like a video camera. It's just a sensor that uses a, a camera. And it uses the Microsoft Xbox Connect camera, which is 70 pounds off the shelf. So it's incredibly cheap. Um, so the idea of that technology is instead of you going into a care situation and having a finger clip put on and wires hanging off you, you just walk into the room and it can monitor up to six people at once. So if you picture being able to walk into an A&E ward, uh, you know, if you're feeling unwell and to know that as soon as you walk in, the nurses know whether or not you're deteriorating and can figure out who to see first on that basis. Or imagine if you're in a, in a care home or otherwise, um, and you want a bit of reassurance that someone's going to pick up very, very early if you're starting to take a turn, um, but without you having to wear anything or charge anything or do anything special. There's obviously a little bit of a privacy issue there, because you've got this camera sat in the corner of the room, but as I said, it doesn't actually record anything. It's literally just a, a window for, for this system to understand your, 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 your signals. So that's the sort of stuff we're, we're dealing with. So it's quite high tech, but actually it's not, the technology's the easy bit. It's how do we change the way we work now that that exists? Because all of a sudden, do you need the nurse to visit every day? Could it instead be a third sector care worker that's visiting you, knowing that your vitals are being monitored and therefore your, your, your risk is handled from a clinical point of view? So that, that's the sort of thing we're talking about here. And so that, that's quite an extreme example. At the other end of the scale, it's maybe things like um, uh, you know, diabetes self-management uh, apps and things like that that will allow uh, people to better manage their own diabetes um, and create their own record of their diabetes care so that when you go to see your GP you can share, share that digitally with your GP. Just, you know, so there's, there's a spectrum from the very, very high tech to the very, very simple. So, so I was asked here today, 
as much as I'd like to talk about all the cool technology we work on, and I'm sure you find that interesting, I was asked is, is they specifically to talk about the national picture and how some of the public sector organizations are moving, moving things forward and trying to take advantage of this digital tech. So there was a, a, a document that came out from the Chief Medical Officer for Scotland uh, a couple of years ago called Realistic Medicine. Now, Realistic Medicine uh, talks about um, a few different elements that we're trying to get better at, especially in NHS Scotland. The first of those is managing risk better. So at the moment, when you interact with the health and care service, um, you know, th there's a lot of risk in a healthcare interaction, and the system tries its best to make sure that you don't come to harm. But in doing that, from a clinical point of view, sometimes it misses on the broader picture of your well-being. So what's clinically optimal is not always best for your overall well-being. Um, so for example, you might go into surgery for something that's, that's wrong with your knee, and then realize after surgery that you can no longer kneel down to garden. Now, how much does gardening mean to you? <laughs> is the question, you know, so there's a balance to be struck there. So even if you get a great clinical outcome, that's not necessary to say you've got a good, a good well-being outcome. And so it's just about kind of balancing that better. We talk about personalized care a lot. It's very difficult to personalize care in a national system that's trying to do a kind of one size fits all for everyone. Um, this is where some of the things you'll see in the consumer marketplace around your smart devices and your own mobile phone things, you have the ability to capture stuff around your own well-being. And the NHS and care organizations need to figure out how to interact with those sorts of technologies because then we'll be able to personalize. So instead of just treating you because you are 50, and that's as sophisticated as the demographic is, we can say you are 50, you are active, uh, you, you uh, are outdoors in the islands of Scotland, um, your mood, you track your mood in a little well-being app and so we get to understand how your, your exercise and your well-being sort of are interlinked and all of a sudden we start to build this picture of you that says, all right, okay, under no circumstances force that person to have a knee operation because it might stop them walking. So all of a sudden you've got a different, a different frame of reference for your, for your interaction. Another uh, key element here is, is reducing variation. Okay, so it's, you know, with, with, with the West, best well in the world, you get different outcomes in different localities across Scotland, in rural areas in particular, you don't have the same access to health, healthcare, et cetera. So a large part of these technologies is how can we make things a little bit more, um, uh, sort of, I think standard is the wrong word, a little bit more predictable from your point of view so that you know that you can have a, a certain level of interaction and that might be having uh, you know, a, a text message conversation with your, your nurse instead of having to rely on a four hour journey to Rate More Hospital and, you know, and, and all the rest of it. So just trying to keep a more continuous, consistent uh, level of support rather than it being a bit patchy. Um, reducing waste is obviously just a, a natural byproduct of creating that, uh, of that, of that more comprehensive picture. Um, and then the last couple, so a change in the decision making. So we're moving from a world in which the doctor says and you do to you and the doctor agree. Okay, so think about in those, in those, in those very crude terms, um, the NHS is trying to begin to adopt an approach where we're co-managing your care with you. Okay, so you know, in the past it was pretty much you go in, stuff is done to you, you know, poked and prodded and you, know, you come out the other end of the system. Um, we're not gonna get those good well-being outcomes if we, if, we, if we work in that way. We need to work with individuals and citizens to, to co-produce and co-manage care. So this, this, is, this is straight from the top, Scottish government thinking at the moment. That's not to say all across the NHS, it's, it's working like that instantly, it takes time, there's a culture that needs to start to sort of evolve around this, but just be aware that when you're dealing with these sorts of pieces of technology, it may seem silly and frivolous and you're just doing a little bit of monitoring or going for a run and you're count, counting your steps, but that is your currency that you can use to personalize your care and give it over the next five or 10 years, you'll start to see that becoming more and more of a reality. So to illustrate, set of smart scales, scale. so there's a Bluetooth uh, scale set that is um, uh, on sale on Amazon today. That about three or four years ago will cost you about 150 pounds. Now it's 25, okay? A wrist monitor, and my wrist monitor has a phone call coming on it right now. <laughs> uh, but a wrist monitor, a very basic one, that will count your steps and your activity. I'm sure you're aware of Fitbits and these sorts of things. This is, this is a polar device, this is you know, 
the basic end of the, uh, of the market. Uh, but again, £25 used to be 125 a few years ago. A smartphone. Now, when, when people say a smartphone, most people would go, ooh, an iPhone, which is 750 quid and £50 pounds a month. You know, that, that's not what a smartphone is. That is a brand of smartphone. That's a very, very extreme end of the smartphone era. What we're looking at here is this is an Android phone, relatively basic, but has all the connect connectivity and internet connection that, and the other, all the enabling parts you would need to make this all work. And that's £100. And that'll last you five, six years. And finally, you need to power that. And so, you know, a basic SIM card of, you know, for, for a connection to the internet these days from a company like GitGaff will cost you £7.50 a month. So the reason I'm painting that to you is from a healthcare delivery <coughs> point of view, what we, what, what we have here is weight, lean muscle mass, hydration, step count, calorie burn, <coughs> sleep, blood pressure, heart rate. That's all passive. So that's stuff that would be relatively simple for you to collect as a, as a user. And you wouldn't really have to do a whole lot other than wear a band and maybe step, step on a, a set of scales every, every, every few days. The active stuff is you might then record your calories, which is a little bit more manual. You, you might have to put those into an app. Uh, you might track your mood, which might be as simple as you uh, having a, set, a grumpy face and a smiley face and a, a few spaces in between, and you just pressing one each morning just to let us know, you know how your mood is. Um, and then this is your window into having a text conversation with the nurse or having a video conversation with, with the GP in, 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 in a neighboring town. This, this, this little device here all of a sudden <laughs> gives you all these options and lets you collect all this information. That top half is what what most healthcare systems would be trading in, in terms of useful information. And usually we only get that when you turn up in an A&E or a GP's office or otherwise. So we're moving into a different phase here when an average GP outpatient or intermediate care appointment is about 117 to 137 pounds. That's what it costs the system, right? You could buy all that stuff for the cost of more or less one appointment, okay? And having all that stuff and you as an active co-managing individual who's trying to empower themselves to take, take, to, you know, to take control of their care, um, could be using all that kit uh, to feed health and care systems. Now this is where it gets a bit ropey because the health and care system is not yet ready for this. Okay? Because this, this is just, just coming out as we speak. Um, but because the price point is now coming down, it's starting to get a bit more realistic. People are going, okay, interesting. That band that monitors your blood pressure, that's, that's C marked. That's medically regulated as a medical device. That's now medical grade. That's the same as what GP would use. It's just tiny on your wrist, right? So we're starting to get into a space where you're going, all right, you can actually see how a healthcare system might be able to have a conversation in these terms with you. We're not quite there yet. Um, there's a whole lot of stuff around trusting the patient or the citizen to monitor themselves. And the healthcare system is not necessarily very good at that. They want you to come in so they can measure you because they'll do it right. So there's a, there's a trust issue there. There's also a consent issue here, which is this is you collecting a bunch of data. And do you want someone looking over your shoulder every day or not? Some people want privacy more than anything else, and so they may not want this. But other people might say, well, hang on. If I did that, would that mean I didn't have to go to my GP every, every few months? And instead, the GP would give me a call if something was going wrong. So you can start moving into a, into a slightly different mode of thinking, which says, all right, OK. Healthcare is there, and it will let me know if, 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 if maybe I need a bit of help. So it's a weird trade-off, which is on the one hand, there's a privacy thing there, and you're getting monitored, but it gives you more independence. So it kind of depends on what, you, what you're after. If you were to collect some simple data about yourself and share it with the NHS, you might be kind of left alone <laughs> to it and just get on with your life, you know? Um, so there's a, there's a little bit of a, a, a trade-off there, and it's not, it won't be for everyone, uh, but... <coughs> When the health and care system is under such pressure, it's un incumbent on us if we want to, if we like this, if we want to work in this way, we need to try and figure out a way of helping the health and care system become more sustainable and doing this kind of self-management and, 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 and taking care of ourselves and, and measuring it in this way is very helpful. So here's a case study of where it is working. Uh, so there's a few little bubbles popping up where people are actually figured out how to join that consumer world with the healthcare world. There's a project called EFRAIL, which is um, in Dumbarton, East Dumbarton at the moment. Um, we're doing this in Na Napier University in a, a company called CN2000, who you'll actually see out in the, in the, um, in the display area through there. And, and their, their kit that we did this with is out there, so you can go and have a play with it if you want. This is exactly what it's described. Set of smart scales, very cheap. Wristband, very cheap. 
basic smartphone in a patient's home, or a citizen's home, and that citizen is someone who um, may, be a, may be, you know, becoming more dependent on healthcare. And that person would normally get very regular checkups and lots of assessments and, and you know, all that sort of stuff. But with the best one in the world, the healthcare system can only manage so much for that person. So you might get a quarterly or biannual checkup and a little assessment about are you becoming frail, do you need extra help, or can we, you know, that sort of thing. What this system does is says if you wear this wristband and if you step on the smart scales every week, those two bits of data wing up into the internet. Um, it combines with the CM2000 care database, which is all the scheduled care that they have. So they, they have this huge database of every single time social care has interacted with anyone in Scotland. And I'm not going to go into the technical details of this, but if you've heard about big data, you've heard about analytics and all this stuff, you feed all that data into a, into a, into a learning computer, which is an artificial intelligence, and it figures out the patterns. And then it says, if this pattern continues, and if this person is like these 20,000 other people that have happened before, in two years' time, they're going to have a fall. And, they, and they're becoming frail. So you might want to intervene in six months and offer them a, a, a new type of service. Okay, so, so all of a sudden, we're getting into a predictive model. So we can say, this person is going to become frail. This person is in danger of a fall. So instead of that person just going in every year, and we'd be lucky if we caught that in a yearly checkup, uh, instead, what we're saying is this system does it every hour. Okay, so you pick, you find that moment just when they're starting to take a turn, and then the key thing here is the technology will get you there. But then, what do you do about it? So, that, so the care service then has to figure out: all right, what's the new care model? We're not going to wait for that person to fall and smash a hit, but we've got to. We've now been told that they're going, that they're, they're on that route. So, what do we do? So, the care system has to figure out a new way of, of dealing with that. And our suggestion would be that the third sector has a big part to play in that. If the healthcare system, if the NHS can do this sort of thing and then, and then identify someone as probably on a path to frailty, then that's a good engagement for a third care organisation to go in there and work on some re activities. So, we've spoken about the enormous amount of data that could be gathered in the community and is being gathered. Monitoring devices for your activity, your sleep, even things like your home. Has anyone got a Scotch gas smart meter installed? So we now know your energy usage. Now that seems like it's disconnected, but your energy usage can be a predictor of your activity, which can be a predictor of your well-being. From that data, we can figure out every time you turn the kettle on. Now, that seems, again, a little bit stupid, but if you combine some basic activity metric with the kettle going on at regular times, you can say, you know, Joanne does this routine every day during the week. For the last three weeks, she seems to be off. It's not her usual routine. What does that mean? All of a sudden, then you've got another hook, <laughs> which is, oh, right, should we be doing something proactive for Joanne? So there's a whole bunch of data in there that we wouldn't think of as healthcare data, but can become relevant for us getting to that preventative model. I'm starting to generate this, this digital image of people. And this is a bit spooky. And if you use Facebook and all these other things, you'll notice the adverts are now getting very, very close to the bone in terms of they're selling you exactly what you want because they're reading your emails and they're reading your Facebook posts and they're understanding all the stuff about you. So it is, it is creepy, but from a healthcare point of view, there's a potentially big win if we can do this in a trustworthy way. That's, that's big if. And there's a lot of stuff around there about the, the individual needs to understand the risks about their data, and they will need to be able to consent to the sharing of that data, and we have to figure out what that looks like. But if we could picture, if we could figure out what that image looks like, all of a sudden we've got that valuable data up into the healthcare system that can reassure the system that you're okay that you don't need help right now, and it reassures you that if you were getting to a point where you might need help, there might be someone who could pop you a quick message and say, by the way, just notice that you know, you've know got a few risk factors here. Um, it, there's a local walking group in the community that goes out every Thursday. Why don't you go and, go and have a walk with them? You, you know, just a little gentle nudge instead of 
come into A and E and let's stick wires and you know all that. You know, so there's an opportunity here just just to, to intervene in a softer way, but only if we have this kind of intelligence. <coughs> so DHI's first challenge area that we'll be working on is looking at what we would term wellness services, and by that I mean if you have hypertension and you go into your GP every three months or six months for a blood blood pressure check, why do you need to go into the GP for that? For twenty-five pounds, you could get you could check your own blood pressure and submit it to your GP. So that's one GP appointment that we don't need to go to. You don't need to go through the hassle of it. The healthcare system can't afford to have all these appointments by routine anymore. So there's a there's a, there's a, there's a joint win there, and there are innumerable cases like that. If you're a, diab a diabetic monitoring your blood glucose, um, you know if you uh, you know, uh, some basic counselling for you know if you've got you know, some mental health, um, you know, uh, and well-being issues, and there's counselling need. You know, there's all sorts of little things that we could do that say, simple bit of data that the patient puts in themselves, or the system puts in this themselves. Figure out how the health and care system can work on a remote basis, just to give them a little nudge, a little bit of help. Have you thought about this service? Have you thought about that service? You know, so there's there's an opportunity there for that very very low-hanging fruit. At scale, around wellness. Okay, so it's a public health piece. <clears throat> Second challenge would be saying that for people who do have slightly more sophisticated needs, who are who, who, who maybe have a couple of long-term conditions, we 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 are starting to learn what the, these people are like, and you can uh, at a national level start to create these profiles for people that say. Broadly speaking, we know what frailty looks like. It usually uh, has these kind of components. Using these machine learning techniques, you can then start to predict frailty and you start to go upstream. So you can start saying, all right, if there are uh, 40,000 people in Scotland right now that have uh, a highly de care dependent, we're getting to the stage where we can say, and these 200,000 people are going to become that group in five years. So what can we do for those 200,000 people now, now, instead of waiting for them to become that next group of, high, of highly dependent people, and try and ex try and give them more independence in that space sooner. So I know it's a bit of a mind screw, <laughs> um, but we, but this is what we're able to now start doing. And so this is what we, we, this this challenge is all around that that frailty example I gave you, which is if the individual wants to, if they want to kick themselves out in that way. The care system needs to figure out how to work with them to, to, to do that risk management and keep them safe in their own homes on their terms. And finally, the system is only as good as its weakest link. And when we talk about risk management, the unscheduled care system, when something goes wrong and we're not ready for it, that's where the system starts to, to break a little bit because it's risk is flying through the roof and so the NHS in particular goes into a kind of state where it's going, okay, we must take you into hospital, even though from a well-being point of view that may not be the best thing for you. So what we're doing here in the bottom half with all this new data and with these, these, these new, uh, this is all context, when the paramedic turns up at your door and you appear short of breath, um, that might be normal for you. The paramedic does not know that. The paramedic sees someone short of breath and takes them into hospital. You might then spend months going through an overly medical system for something that at the very early point could have been preempted if that, if that paramedic had access to some of your data that said, this is what normal looks like for me. And all of a sudden that paramedic goes, all right, so this is good. You're good, everyone's happy, great. False alarm, I'm off. And, I, and because you've got that monitoring kit, a GP might pop in after a few weeks and just check up on you based on that data that they're getting. Okay. So I'm not going to walk through this. This is more if anyone wants the slides after this and if they want to come talk to DHI about these things. We're going to be creating a, di a, a digital playground that will allow service users, citizens, patients, carers, professionals, etc., to come and play with some of these new, new technologies and familiarize themselves with them. And we want to elicit your feedback and understand uh, more about, you know, where is the line in the sand? Because all this stuff is very potentially invasive and there's some privacy concern, but could be very effective. And we, you know, everyone will be different. 
I mean, I, I, you know, I, I'll let anyone monitor me for anything, and I, you know, if, it, if it means I'll have a better health outcome, but other people might take a different view. Um, and so we've got some basic functions that we're going to test inside that technology playground around trust in data, consent to share data, um, you know, making sure that you know that everyone is, is is happy on that space. From a clinical point of view, making sure that we know how to interact with that data. What happens when someone turns up in a GP practice with all this information? How, do, how, do, how does that work? The GP doesn't have an hour to sit and squeak through all this information with you. So we have to make that realistic. Um, so I'm putting that out there just, just to, in case anyone has a particular uh, thing they want to come and talk to me uh, you know, at the stand or, or, or here afterwards. Um, uh, we'll be getting this playground gearing up around about May, June. Um, this year, um, and that'll be something that we're running for a couple of years, just to try and move this all along a little bit and help the healthcare system and individual citizens figure out how to do this together. Okay, that's me. Thank you very much. <laughs>